Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Won't you please have a seat? Good to see everyone this fine day. So glad that uh, you are joining us here in person or online. Uh, what a great opportunity for us to gather together as one church in two locations here at the church or at home. And uh, so glad that you're here today. Uh, a couple of things that I just want to thank you for. Number one, thank you so much for your continued uh, faithfulness and giving. Uh, God continues to bless us and uh, you as we uh, are in this partnership together. And the other thing I wanted to take time to thank you for is thank you so very much for your willingness to help out Nixon Elementary in our uh, blitz for Nixon, our disinfecting wipes. I took two boxes, two really good sized boxes over to Nixon. And a teacher met me at the door, and they wanted to take all of the, uh, the disinfecting wipes for their own classroom. They didn't want to give it to anybody else because they wanted to have them all. But uh, I tell you what, they shared, I promise, they really did. But uh, thank you so much. Um, I didn't count how many there were, but there were plenty, and they were so very excited. And we also blessed them with some uh, masks for the kids as well. Because as they arrive to school, if the kids forgot theirs or don't have one, uh, the school then can have one on hand for them and just a way for us to be a blessing. So thank you, church family, for the blessings that you are giving to other people. And I tell you what, uh, simple things such as that go a long, long way. As I was uh, leaving and talking to people, the principal caught me and was the last thing she said was, Thank you so much for your church and for the way that you care for us. So way to go, church. Uh, proud of you. You guys put your best foot forward, and I'm so excited for what God has in store for us and that relationship that we have with them. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, last thing I want to talk about before we get into our message is this, is that um, I wanted to give you just a quick little update on things that are going on with our building. Uh, first of all, I wanted to just let you know that we have uh, finished all of the contractor work that needed to be done for our building. The things that we have to do now are finishing touches. And there's a whole long list of those finishing touches. They'll happen. They'll get done in, in, uh, in the near future. But things are moving in the right direction. We've got things to do such as cleaning, things to do such as putting a baseboards back on and painting and all of that. But the big stuff, the stuff that we were waiting for in September, October, November, and part of December are all done. And now it's the fun stuff of getting the little final touches together. And so I just wanted to say thank you for your patience because your patience is uh, going a long ways as we recover from the derecho. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, but then also, uh, as we have things that come up that need help, we might just ask you, and maybe you are willing to help out, uh, but we have a great group of trustees that want to get things moving and get them in the right direction. So uh, God is good, right? Amen. Amen. That was really slow. So God is good. Amen. Hey, all right, there we go. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just about choked right there. <laughs> okay, we are starting a brand new sermon series. Uh, it's called Journey to the Cross. And over the next couple of weeks, what we are going to be doing is that we are going to go on a journey through the Gospels. We are going to walk the path of Jesus' life from about the middle of the Gospels to the end. Because we're going to be really moving our way as Jesus turned his focus to the cross. Something that we realize about, about Scripture is that about um, at the end of year two of Jesus' earthly ministry, he really began to focus in on the cross. And so over the next couple of weeks, all the way up to Easter, actually, we're going to be uh, following this path along with Jesus, and we're going to be encountering many different styles of Scripture. We're going to encounter passages that have to do with stories, with miracles, with teachings, with um, Jewish 
teachings. And so we're going to be journeying through this with Jesus over the next couple of weeks. And I'm excited about it because each week we're going to pick out a passage of scripture that will help us unpack what Jesus is doing in the life of his people, but then also what we get to experience and what we get to learn, what really matters for us to understand and for us to have a big picture of. And some of it, it's going to be uh, quite interesting, I really believe. So over the next couple of weeks, just want to encourage you um, that we're not necessarily going through a book of the Bible, but we are going through Jesus's life. So we'll be jumping around from Matthew to Mark, Luke, and John. And I'm excited about it because I don't think I've ever preached something like this, a um, a a a series like this. So I'm excited about it. I hope that you are as well. Um, Today, we're going to be spending all of our time in Mark chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 7, and uh, that's where we're going to be spending our entire time, verses 1 through 23. And just a reminder, we utilize what is called the Bible app here at Living Hope. And so if you don't have your, uh, your physical Bible with you, open up your phone. You can get the Bible app and go to events on the more button. And then in the events page, you'll be able to find Living Hope Wesleyan Church. And you can follow along with all the passages of scripture that we, that I use and we reference here on Sunday mornings. But before we get into Mark 7, I want to give you a, uh, a little bit of background into what's going on, a little bit of context to the entire uh, passage of what we're doing. So the background in chapter 6 is that Jesus is at the highest point of his ministry and his popularity in chapter 6. If you briefly look back, you'll see that Jesus is encountering crowds everywhere he goes. And in part of that, he is dealing with the feeding of the 5,000. Now, you've heard it said before that maybe, or at least I hope you have, that uh, when Jesus fed the 5,000, it just wasn't 5,000 people, but there were uh, maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000. I heard this week uh, from someone that they think that uh, the crowd could have been up to 25,000 people were there when Jesus fed the multitude. And here's the reason why. Um, families were, were the, the men were counted that day. But uh, they probably had families, and they probably had, well, not only a bride, but they probably had some kids. And uh, most good Jewish families just didn't have one kid, but they had a, uh, a couple, maybe three, four, maybe five. I don't know. But they had a lot of family that was there and present. So the, the possibility uh, was 25,000 people were there. I always capped the number at about 15,000 just because that's a, 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 a guy, his bride, and then one kid. And I realized, huh, that might not be the case. But anyways, keep on cruising. Um, Because of Jesus's miracle and feeding the 5,000, the the crowd was so into it. They, They loved it so much, and they appreciated the teaching that Jesus had. They wanted to force Jesus to become king. Force him to become king. And Jesus is like, nope, that's not what I'm here for. He doesn't say that, but basically it's like, nope, mm -mm, slow your roll, just calm down. And then what we find out is in the gospel of John in chapter six, we find out that Jesus issues a very difficult teaching where he's talking about uh, the bread of life and that he is the bread of life. And if anyone were to feast on me, They would inherit eternal life. Do you remember that teaching? Really, really difficult teaching for the uh, for the the Jewish people at that point in time, because it sounded uh, bizarre that Jesus would encourage them to feast on him and his flesh. He's really talking about the bread of life. And what ends up happening is that people begin to abandon him. Jesus is at the height of his ministry, his, the height of his popularity. He issues this teaching that is difficult, and the people begin to abandon him. And he looks at the disciples and he says, will you abandon me as well? Will you leave me as well? Is the teaching too hard for you that you will ignore what I'm doing? And John, or, and, uh, John tells us that Peter's like, nope. 
You have the words of life. Where else would we go? So this is a turning point in Jesus's ministry. It's the last year of his ministry. It's his focus to the cross. And we pick up in chapter 7 in Mark. Something that's unique about this passage is that Mark does a thing that uh, I find really cool, and it's something that we call uh, parenthetical references. When there is a, uh, a definition or something that is an explanation within Scripture, we call that a parenthetical reference because it's explaining something that we need to know within the Scripture. And Mark does a really good job of explaining a few things that we as outsiders, as, as not Jewish folk, we don't really get without an explanation. And Mark does a really good job of explaining that. You'll see it. I'll make note of it, but that's pretty cool. Um, so Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Let's go ahead and uh, look at the first five verses, and then we will get going. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from uh, Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. Pay attention to those, those words. And actually, we see that this is a parenthesis within the Scripture, so that's a parenthetical reference right there. Holding on to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Verse 5, so the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus is just moments away from feeding 5,000 people, from doing an amazing teaching from leading and dealing with the crowds and the Pharisees and the scribes, that's the, the teachers of the law, they're scribes. These guys are experts in the law and they question Jesus about what? But first of all, let's talk about these guys. They held strictly to the law, strictly to the law and at times went beyond the typical instructions of the law and had just about a rule for everything. So the rule that they were following in this and asking Jesus, why don't your, your disciples wash their hands? Their rule was, well, if you go anywhere and you want to come back and eat, it's better for you to ceremonially wash, whether you touched anything or not, to actually make sure that your hands are, are clean. And so you ceremonially wash them. Now, this is called the tradition of the elders, and we read that. And the tradition of the elders has to do with the amount of information that was passed down from one generation of rabbis to the next. And it's as if these Pharisees and these scribes and these teachers of the law put the law of God inside a huge yard, and then they put a huge fence around the yard in order to protect the law. And they kept extending the fence further and further away, and they kept on adding rules and rules and rules on top of the law in order to protect, protect the law. In fact, there was a, a document that was called the Mishnah, and it was a collection of the wise sayings and teachings of uh, many different rabbis and the musings of them. And in that document, it records 30 chapters, 30, three zero, of ceremonial washing and ritual washings. So they, they, they not only wash their hands in a specific way, they would wash their cups, they would wash their bowls, they would wash their chairs, they would wash a lot of things to ceremonially make sure that they were clean, so that they weren't, undef they weren't defiled, so that they weren't uh, defiled before God. And what it did is it led to a hollow, useless, pointless worship experience for most people. Why? Why? 
because there was no way that these people in the non-Jerusalem context could hold on to all the laws. They didn't travel to the temple every single day. The Jerusalem people might have, but people that live far away, they couldn't do that. They couldn't follow all these rules. They couldn't follow all these laws that they were enacting upon them. And so there was no way for them to be able to follow all of this. And the Jerusalem Pharisees and scribes looked down upon anyone that didn't follow the tradition of the elders. So what are the, the scribes and the Pharisees upset about? They are upset that the disciples, Jesus' disciples, the guys that, that Jesus has let follow him, they're upset that they're not following the tradition of the elders. You see, they, they thought that Jesus, being the, the famous teacher that he was, well, he's going to follow our traditions. Jesus who is gaining popularity all throughout the land, is going to follow every single rule that the Mishnah, the Talmud, and all of that describes. He's going to be like us. But they quickly find out that it's not. The problem in all of this is that Jesus and his disciples didn't follow the tradition of the elders. These folks took these traditions and elevated it so high that it trumped Scripture. That's the problem. That's the issue. There is not a definition of ceremonial washing in Scripture to the point that these guys were practicing. So the problem is that the traditions of men were more important. And it makes me wonder, if that's the way that we work, if that's the way humans work, where we take traditions and we elevate them above the Word of God, how have we done that exact same thing? How have we allowed traditions of men, not of mankind, humans, how have we allowed those things to trump the Word of God? Ten years ago, doing church online wouldn't have been thought about. It would have been sacrilege. Why? Because it's not the way that we do things, right? We do church, and we meet on a Sunday morning, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 10.30, maybe, maybe a little bit earlier, depends on how, how many services you have to have, let alone, uh, heaven forbid that you do a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening service. Oh, no, that was, that was okay. Sunday evening was all right. But Saturday night, no way. Can't do that. What about um, having um, traditions at Christmas? Like having to have an Advent uh, candle wreath lit every single Sunday. I break that tradition every year because I don't always have an Advent calendar or Advent candles and the wreaths and all that stuff. Or what about uh, the tradition of, um, of giving gifts at Christmas? There's nowhere in the Bible that says that we have to give gifts at Christmas. But if we don't, Bad, isn't it? What about uh, the way that we do weddings or funerals? Think about some of those traditions that we practice within a wedding or within a funeral. Is there anywhere in Scripture that says that we have to do those certain things? But the moment that we break tradition? A couple of years ago, in weddings, one of the things that became more and more popular was the, um, well, when Andrea and I got married, it was the unity candle. That was the tradition that was really, really practiced and really cool. Um, a few years ago, um, it was turned to unity sand. And I'm like, what is that all about? that's not okay. And then um, just a couple years ago, there was a wedding that I did that uh, did um, 
wedding knots. They took string and they each one represented a, a three strands, a cord of three strands. It has some scripture reference to it. But uh, they used that instead of a unity candle or even unity sand. And I'm like, yes, we can do that. <laughs> it's not a tradition. But how often do we get caught up on tradition? One of the things that I realize is that um, methods, methods need to change every now and then in order to practice the worship that we need to be able to be doing because methods are not scripture. What always holds consistent is the word of God. Our, our Bible that we trust, that we follow, Sometimes the methods get elevated above Scripture. And that's where it's really dangerous. And Jesus is directly speaking against these things. And so my question for you is this, is how do you, how do we value God's Word? Is the Word of God, Scripture, the most important voice that we listen to when it comes to the, the Word of God? I mean, obviously we listen as well to the voice of God speaking to us, but what about his word that we can actually read and trust and hold on to? Um, is there another viewpoint that is in our lives that is beginning to take the top spot above Scripture? Is it a current value or is it a, um, something else? Has something like a certain current ideology that is contrary to the word of God beginning to creep up the ladder. We need to be really, really careful because there are a lot of ideologies in the world that we live in that are beginning to creep up more and more. And if we allow them to take precedent over scripture, we're in trouble where our worship that we have would be very much hollow, very much um, useless, pointless, because our hearts would not be in it. And that's exactly what was happening to these scribes and these Pharisees. Everything they did was for show. The ritualistic cleaning on their hands was done for show. The way that they gave um, tithes and offerings in the temple, done for show. We don't need to be going there. We need to be really, really careful. The truth is, is that the message of the Old Testament and New Testament from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, and later on in Mark is still the same. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That still rings true from Old Testament to New Testament. Let's look at Jesus' response in verse 6 and into 9. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Jesus brings into view Isaiah's passage depicting the heartless worship of the people of God before the exile, and they're holding on traditions, uh, human traditions back then, and they were worshiping in vain and, and honoring God with their lips, but their hearts were not in it, and it's continued on to that day. And, and this is a scathing response by Jesus. These scribes and Pharisees who are experts in the law of God should know better than to have traditions that trump the teaching of God, the actual word of God and the word that they were supposed to be experts in. They should have realized that that is not the way that you do things 
but they just kept on following with the people before the exile. Jesus continues, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. Jesus is about ready to throw some real uh, truth down, some, uh, some examples in, in their own practices. So he says, Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is put to death. But you say that anyone who declares that what they might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. This is one example where uh, Jesus is really hitting him in the face with something that is very, very difficult and something that is, um, was despicable. They believe that you should honor your father and mother, as we do, right? And there was a practice back then that um, when a father or mother got age, the older and upper in years, that the children would receive them into their home and take care of them. What was happening was that people at that point in time, they were saying, oh, no, all the money that I have is Corbin. Well, what's that mean? Well, they would say that everything that I have is Corbin. It's devoted to God. I will give it to God someday because it was a deferred gift to God, a deferred. It would happen later. And they would take all that they would have and hold it for themselves and not help anyone because everything that they had was devoted to God and someday it would be given to God. So basically it's by it's telling mom and dad, I'm sorry, everything that I have, everything that I own is all devoted to God and I can't help you with it because if I were to help you with it, I would be breaking the vow that I made to God. And so therefore mom and dad, you have to fend for yourself. So they're breaking the command of honor your father and mother by utilizing an empty command that said, everything that I have is devoted to God. And Jesus is saying, great, you do this and you're breaking the law of God by your own traditions. And you know what was even worse is that they would live off of Corbin. Everything that they devoted to God, they would live off of it. They wouldn't actually take it to the temple and give it to God until later. That's despicable. And Jesus is saying, you do things like that all the time. Verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside, outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Jesus has taken the crowd that could be around him, and he's saying, hey, listen, these teachings about not touching things, these teachings about the things that can defile you by going into you, don't worry about that. What actually defiles you is what comes out of you. Verse 17, after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull? <laughs> Can you imagine being a disciple and Jesus says, are you so dull? Are you not getting it? Come on, guys. I would not want to be that one, but sometimes we, we are dull, aren't we? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach. And then out of the body. Kids, if you're not catching what, throw, what Jesus is throwing down here, ask your mom and dad, okay? In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. That's another parenthetical reference that Mark is talking about. Verse 20. He went on, what comes out of the heart defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils 
come from inside and defile a person. It's as if Jesus has taken a big old mirror and put it in front of the people. And he says, what makes a person impure is not what they take in physically, but it's what they're giving, the fruit that is coming out of them. You see, there was a huge focus on the external focus of righteousness. Washing the outside of the bowl, washing the outside of the cup, whitewashing the tomb so that it looks good. And Jesus is saying, no, it's not the external stuff. It's the inside stuff. Jesus turns the whole system, the whole ritualistic worship system on its head. And I think it's vital for us to understand this. Because we can get caught up in the ritual and hold it all to a higher standard than what it should. But Jesus addresses the heart. What is coming out of you is what is important. The fruit of your life. What defiles you is the things that are in your heart that are unclean. Like immorality. Theft, the desire to steal, the, the hatred, adultery, greed, wanting more and more and more. Deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, all of this stuff is what makes us unclean before the Lord. It's what doesn't allow us to be righteous before a holy God. And so we get lost in these things. And part of it reminds us to look at how we worship. Where's our heart at when we arrive on a Sunday morning? Where's our heart at when we sit down with our Bible in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening? Are we just going through the motions of our relationship with Jesus? I, I remember growing up with my, my family. I was one of three boys. And there was this thing that my mom would do. I love my mom dearly. She's awesome. But it would drive my brothers and I crazy on Sunday mornings. She would wear high heels on a hardwood floor, and my brothers and I slept in the basement. So she's clomping around. I think she did this to wake us up. But she's clomping, clomping, clomping. And, and we are trying to sleep, you know, because it's Sunday morning. Let's get an extra hour of sleep in. We don't have to go to school. Everything's fine. And mom is, it's like she's doing a tap dance in the kitchen. It's bad. It's really bad. And what happened to us nine out of ten times is we would get up in a bad mood because we were being woken up by moms clomping around in the kitchen. And then we would start getting angry at each other because one's in the bathroom too long, one's not doing this, they won't let me borrow that, and blah, and we are just fighting. And we had like a ten-minute drive from home to the church, country church in, in Colorado. And seriously... By the time we got there and we pull in the parking lot, we're still bickering. And then the, as soon as we open the door, it's like the smile comes on and everything's good. And we're extremely fake. I admit it. We walked into the church like we were best friends and everything's fine. Hollow. Sat down, sang songs, worship, hollow. I remember it because I remember still being able to little elbow to my brother or usually it was an elbow coming back to me that was harder than I was the little brother so they I I got picked on I was the little one always getting abused I'm just kidding my brothers love me so much but the point is we can get caught up in hollow worship just like anybody else what I want you to think about this week is this where can I not be hollow in my relationship with Jesus? How am I approaching Sunday morning? How am I approaching 
my devotions whenever I have them so that my heart and my mind is focused on what God wants to teach me and show me? How am I ritualistic in my, uh, my anything? Let's, let's talk about something for just a moment, okay? I'm good at this, and I'm just going to give you an open uh, window into my soul. I am good at saying a really wonderful dinner prayer so that we can eat. It's hollow as all can be because I'm focused on getting some food because I'm hungry. When was the last time not only did I thank God for the food, but I actually thanked him for the work that he did in my life that day at the dinner table? What if your prayer time at dinner turned out to be a worship experience instead of, uh, thank you for the food, let's eat? Seriously? When and where are we ritualistic and not heartfelt in our worship? That's my challenge for you this week. Find it and destroy it. Get rid of it so that your heart is focused in on God. A heart that is in love with God is not hypocritical, not empty ritualistic, and it's not bearing good fruit. Let's be focused in on him. Let's pray. Father, your love for us is so amazing. And as we get to watch Jesus over the coming weeks really uh, change his focus on focusing on the cross, Lord, we're going to learn a lot. And today, Lord, we've already experienced that your goodness and your mercy is a great gift. And we want to experience that. And we want to have hearts that are full in worship towards you focused, and that our, the fruit of our lives is good, not hollow, not useless, not powerless, but that we are worshiping you in all that we do. Lord, help us this week to find those parts of our lives where it's not, or where it's not adding up, and help us to get rid of it and focus solely on you. We pray these things on your son's holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen.